Hello and aloha, all you beings, you lovely beings all over the place. Mm -hmm. And your pet beings, a few of you out there. <laughs> Some of you look like you're in colder weather than others. Most of you probably know Amanda, she's been on Helping Us before, and she's going to be continuing uh, to help uh, hold the Zoom space and technology. Thanks, Amanda. And Darine, most of you also know from previous retreats. And, and Jake, a lot of you have sat also with Jake, or Jake and I and Michelle. Uh, Jake is on the East Coast. So he's bundled up. <laughs> and he's, uh, uh, he's been helping uh, retreats with me for many, many years. And was also in Burma uh, as a monk and studying and translating helping us with the Metta Dana project, so on and so forth. Jake can be very busy, but he's also very relaxed. And like Darine and Amanda, very kind soul. So you'll hear his voice as well today. Anything we need to know, Amanda? I don't think so. I was just going to okay. post in the chat um, that we'll take questions at the end. So if anyone has any technical issues, you're welcome to message me. But otherwise, we can get started. Great. Hello, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to see you. Hi. Hi, Darina. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sweet. <laughs> Wow. So I will offer some uh, short instructions and then we'll sit quietly together. And it's just the same format. Um, Steve will um, uh, give a Dharma talk and then we'll take questions. So go ahead and just start finding can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. So go ahead and start finding a comfortable, alert posture. Perhaps Taking a few deep breaths. As a support of landing here, being here. And you can just start settling the attention, perhaps just slowly, just around the space. The space around the body. Or the skin. Mm. 
slowly settling within the body. Remembering that we're shifting to a non-doing awareness. So perhaps we can start just receiving sound vibration. Just as it's happening. Or silence. See, the attention can be concurrent with the sound vibration as it appears, exists, and disappears. And if there is a thought about the experience or a visual image of the sound, and as we know, we don't try to get rid of it, push it away. You can just notice it as thinking or as seeing. bringing the attention back to just receiving the vibrations and textures as they come and go by themselves. Sometimes it's helpful to narrow the attention to a smaller area of experience, like our hands. And the same way as we were receiving sounds, you can just let your attention settle around the hands or in the surface in a small area or the whole hand. It doesn't really matter. You're just receiving directly experience without the filter of the conceptual mind. Perhaps there is some tingling, some warm, coolness. Numbness.
connecting, receiving with the physical sensations. As they, they change moment by moment. And from time to time, it's helpful to check the quality of the mind, quality of awareness. See if there is this quality of accepting life as it is appearing. Perhaps an emotion like joy or sadness, boredom, sleepiness, excitement. The same way as we receive physical sensations, we do the same with emotions or mental states. Sometimes it's useful to use a mental note on the very act of a soft, mental note can help us to disengage with any form of identification to that emotion or mental state. Not my anger, not my enthusiasm, it's just anger, just enthusiasm. Always dropping into the body, feeling the corresponding sensations, physical sensations of an emotion. Perhaps connecting with the movement of the breath. With, sens with the sensations of the rising, just when it's, the rising is happening. With the sensations, with the movement of falling, just as falling is happening. Nothing to do. Just 
just letting the breath be as it is. Short, shallow, long, tight. But if you know that, notice that there is some tightening or a sense of controlling the breath, sometimes it's helpful just to move to another anchor, perhaps back to the sounds, hands, or body sensations throughout physical body sensations throughout, throughout the whole body. All the anchors are equally valuable. So we learn when what's available, we, we make an, an honest assessment that's available. And skillfully, we remove or explore and settle in, our, in a calm, steady way in our anchor. Checking if awareness is kind, gentle, compassionate. To whatever is appearing.
Thank you, Doreen. Eh? For putting us in our bodies and in the moment with things as they are. We can nurture that connection if we like after a sitting where all the formations seem settled and there's a sense of being embodied with this alive present time awareness. So if by continuing to feel your breath, you know, every few moments or feel the body, some, some touchstone, an arising mental mood or emotion, as Darine was uh, as describing you know, how, how to feel and sense, hold it, know it uh, in the body, in the moment that it's happening. There's a continual sense of refreshing uh, when we have that connection to the present moment through whatever means awareness itself or, or knowing itself can be that connection to the present moment, the awareness of knowing, as well as just the simplest sensations, vibrations, plate of pressure, doesn't matter. Whatever seems to just to come through the, the dome of our awareness, we can reconnect with. So I thought today to just give a, a brief overview of aspects of equanimity that might be helpful in daily life and in practice. Well, I'll start with that. Uh, Jake may add to that. And then we'll all um, field any questions you might have at the end. I find it helpful to, to hold equanimity through three different lenses. Uh, and one is equanimity as a spiritual power or virtue or quality of goodness itself, just as a skillful mindset, quality of mind, uh, an emotion, a, a spiritual emotion. It's the it's the last of the 10 paramis, these 10 qualities of goodness that we've spoken of over the past months in retreats or Sunday sittings. A parami, equanimity as a parami is a, is a bridge between our formal inward meditation practice and just being connected with our day-to-day -day life outside of, of the formal times of sitting. Our attention is turned inward when we practice meditation, sitting, standing, walking, lying. And it's more engaged with the surround, uh, environmental surround or with, with other, other beings when we're outside of that time of solitude and seclusion. So as a, as a parami, uh, the tenth parami, actually following metta, um, it's said that uh, upeka, equanimity, purifies metta, the ninth parami, uh, and the other Brahma Viharas. Um, even as metta is said 
to bring moisture to equanimity and the other paramis and other skillful states, the practice states and so forth. The, the second lens through which I wanna to briefly touch uh, is as a Brahma Vihara, a, a divine abiding. In January, we did a month long focusing on each Brahma Vihara, Metta, Karuna, compassion, Murita, empathetic joy, and equanimity. As a Brahma Vihara, it relates to other, other beings. And the third lens is um, as the path of awakening, the, the seven factors that are cultivated every time we're mindful. So even if we're not sure what the seven factors are, if we're, if we're practicing as best we can, that moment to moment mindfulness, feeling the sensation now and the breath now, the thought that's arisen, the sound, and it's in this continuous rhythm of open, relaxed, mindful awareness and investigation, and they're trying to penetrate through the, uh, the veil of unknowing that is continually trying to interpret experience into conceptual sets, into an analysis. So breaking, breaking through that. So metta is the, the moisturizer for the intelligence and greater wisdom of equanimity. Uh, and then the equanimity likewise further purifies the metta and other other paramis. It said that the function of, of equanimity, the Pali word upeka, is to see things impartially. And that the manifestation is the, the easing off of attraction and repulsion. The mind that responds to experience with that immediate liking and attraction or dislike, pushing away, repulsion. The proximate cause of equanimity is said to be reflecting that beings inherit their, um, the results of their volitional actions, the three doorways of action being volitional thoughts, and volitional or intentional speech, and, and action, intentional actions. So to reflect that, that whatever beings, ourselves included, whatever we meet in life, day to day, moment to moment, is the, the result the results from our, the previous habits and patterns of our thoughts, speech, and actions. Um, so it's just nature. It's the law of, of uh, karma and the fruition of karma. It's a good reflection, for example, when we're on retreats and uh, we find the mind being judgmental of our own practice or of other people's practice and behavior or maybe resentful. Uh, we may be re resentful of our own past good practice if we're not experiencing something satisfactory to us in this moment. Or we might feel resentful for someone else uh, whose practice seems to be going better in our judgment, in our idea. Uh, so then to reflect that you know, the, the good experience I may have uh, from, from sitting and going through the pleasure and pain and gain and loss of, of a sitting, a 45 minute sitting or longer, uh, or someone else's practice who seem real quiet and real in there, uh, 
the, the results of that, uh, whether it's good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, are due to the fruition of actions, due to natural law, not to according to our wishes. So that kind of reflection is one of the ways we actually practice the Brahma, Brahma Vihara of equanimity. It said that uh, in the text, it says that when there's no equanimity, then uh, actions that are maybe offensive to us from others can cause the mind to waver, to oscillate, to be unstable. And just, just to recognize that, and sometimes it's a, it's a good wisdom approach to seeing what's going on. So the habit of identification and continually, you know, projecting as out there and in here uh, and to objectify that person's practice is good, that person's practice or behavior is bad and so forth. Just to come around and recognize, oh yeah, the mind is wavering, the, the heart is oscillating, there's, there's no stability. Just to approach the immediacy, not the content of what the experience is, can, can bring, can soothe our system, and kind of bring us into a balanced, relaxed place. In the same way, the parami of equanimity can go through all these goodness qualities, through all the other paramis, like uh, generosity, like sila or virtue, re renunciation, uh, relinquishing our attachments and so forth. And in each case, it, um, it purifies, it in, empowers, it brings them to fruition. So that, for example, we don't rely on older habits of starting to deliberate when we're about to do something generous, to give something, and instead of having thoughts of, well, maybe I'll need that later, you know, or we deliberate whether the gift is something we can let go of or whether it's appropriate, whether it's you know, the right gift to give, uh, whether it's that the right person to give, we, we deliberate about the recipient. Uh, and so we just sort of trip out on that goodness, that dana goodness, that generosity goodness. The equanimity comes and dispels all that oscillation, all that wavering, uh, all that deliberation, just should I do it or should I not do it? You know, and in the same way with, um, um, sila, uh, virtue, uh, our values, and um, you know, how we act, how we want to act, the, the equanimity purifies this quality in us, and, and this aspiration, this parami of goodness, of um, being free of attachment and fear, developing the kind of value and purifying the, the uh, quality and depth of that virtue uh, without the deliberation. You know, am I worthy? Can, uh, am I worthy? Do I have this purity? Do I have this value? Do I have this um, beauty? of virtue within me. The equanimity just connects with the virtue itself uh, and dispels the doubts about whether we're worthy of it or have it or not, or someone else has it or not. And that way we can go through all 10 paramis and reflect on and see, contemplate how equanimity purifies each one to be what it is to be the essence of what it is. And for example, energy is another one that's important, day-to-day uh, -day important for our practice, particularly because when it's in excess that we're, we're, um, we're expending all of our energy we're, and we're, we're gonna be exhausted. We're gonna drain it out. It's not self-sustaining. With the equanimity, there's a, 
a natural energy conservation preservation that happens because of its ability toward renewal and holding the essence of balanced energy. It's what balances energy is the equanimity. So to see them in a, in a pair is pretty powerful when we're practicing uh, and see and feel uh, the energy that comes up and is it being driven or is there a pushing or a um, um, frenetic need to reach some goal? You know, or is it balanced? Is it easy without going into, you know, slacking off and sluggish? But to recognize that and to recognize the great balancing power uh, and purification power of the equanimity, which brings energy into being able to be within ourselves. There's a sports term. I don't know if it comes from um, soccer or baseball or what, uh, but it says to uh, an athlete who's able to, to play within themselves are playing within their limits and capabilities at any one time. So they may not be getting scoring, you know, all the soccer points or getting all the home runs or whatever um, that day, uh, breaking records. It's not like that. It's that they know what they can do. That athlete knows the what energy they have that's capable and what their limitation is. So they don't sh short shrift themselves and they don't go beyond themselves. They play within that zone and it's beautiful to see, like watching an African gazelle you know, sail over the savanna. Uh, it's just the perfection of it. It doesn't matter what they're scoring or not scoring, or even if they scored. It's just that it's, a, it's an art form when we're in that zone. So we can do that in our practice, in our daily life, in our relations, to know what our limits, know what our capabilities are, and to kind of um, to play within that zone. also requires a lot of patience, another of the paramis. I think it took 10,000 years for the Polynesian navigators to get from the Solomon Islands to Samoa. And then they spent about, uh, you know, each time they were just, they were within their limits and capabilities. They were learning, they, they were attuning to the signs and symbols, uh, the currents, the you know, ocean currents, the air currents, the clouds, and, and seeing how far they could sail, you know, in line of sight, island to island, uh, but for a very long time, not going to beyond uh, what they couldn't see, not going over the horizon, all the while perfecting their craft, making their, their craft this this art-like form that could sail open ocean, deep ocean, blue water sailing, I think it's called, and their own skills in sailing and attunement through the, the six sense doors to, to all the elements. In that way, they, they finally got a read that got them to Samoa. And then they were in Samoa, I think for another 3000 years before suddenly they, they sailed everywhere you know, south to the Marquesas, to Tahiti, uh, to um, uh, New Zealand, north to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and in a short period of time, they actually filled this called the Polynesian Triangle. It took a lot, of, a lot of time, a lot of practice, you know, the same as meditation, a lot of discipline, honing their skills of observation, their capacity, their limitation, uh, their the craft of their sails and boat and rudder and paddles, and and how to how to how to live in those in that wilderness, the great blue wilderness. So with the equanimity, one is kind of unfettered uh, 
by the, the doings and actions that are, are out there. I mean, one sees what's happening, but then makes an assessment, an intelligent assessment, ideally through the lens of equanimity and understanding what's happening. And also continuing to perfect the abiding in a loving kindness. Loving kindness brings about that moisture that's necessary, you know, for the other paramis and brings about um, the sense of, of love, curiosity, connection with things. Uh, you know, without that, um, again, people's energy falls, drops. The relations also become complicated and uneasy. So you always see them together in the Brahma Viharas, they're all together in the Paramis, Metta and Upeka, our equanimity. They're together as the last two. Uh, and the, the Metta moisturizes all the other Paramis and is a catalyst for cultivating them, feeding them, nurturing them. The equanimity brings them all into balance, purifies them all. That's how they work in the, and so in that way, you can see parami as a bridge between our inner secluded forms of practice in our, in our engaged ways. It's a bridge between uh, uh, the inner and the outer, the so-called inner and outer, uh, the solitude and the interactive. Um, it's also a bridge between the various practices. So looking at, uh, well, just to say that the meaning uh, of upeka actually is to look to or to look upon, to look over, as opposed to looking away. It helps us understand that equanimity is not its so-called near enemy of indifference, which is a disconnect or dissociation. It's very much engaged. Uh, and as you know, when we practice the parami, uh, the Brahma Viharas together, the other Brahma Viharas are always there when we practice one of them, all four are up. Even if equanimity, for example, is more forward and front stage. Um, another term for this, Jake might correct the pronunciation, tatra, tatra majatata, long word. Uh, uh, and I've been trying to pronounce it right for 40 years. It means standing in the middle of all this, being in the middle of all this, or there in the middleness there in the middleness, beautiful depth definition um, of equanimity. But as a Brahma Vihara, since I mentioned them already, um, Brahma Viharas relate to our relations and uh, help refine and energize, empower and beautify our relationship to ourselves. Of equanimity, along with the other Brahma, Brahma Viharas uh, for ourselves. And, you know, we practice that being able to kind of fill the spaces, to fill our bodies and to fill kind of the immediate space around us, like a cocoon of equanimity. And then you know, to, to fill what are called the four quarters of the world of the universe. And, and then all the other spaces in between and above and below, all around, everywhere. Uh, that's the abiding in equanimity. And it's putting out this energetic uh, re reverberating force of stability, profound peace. That's 
the feeling tone is neutral, neither pleasant or unpleasant. It's, it's non-reactive. And that's that, that power of being in the midst of things as they are, they are and being able to see clearly you know, how, how could the navigator not be able to access that kind of centeredness to, to be able to finally uh, make those amazing journeys, you know, thousands of years before the Westerners with their ships, just with the bare intelligence of their own body, sense doors, attunement to the environment, that was their tool and, and seeing, feeling how the currents were flowing and so forth. The mind imbued with equanimity then is immeasurable, uh, abundant, exalted, without any hostility or ill will. You, you know what that feels like in those moments where we have that and that, what that means for the landscape of our meditation. You know, how then we, we have the resources to know, to explore, you know, to be still, to investigate, to see what's there, what's excess, what's lacking, you know, and to correct that. Um, the, other, the other lens is through the awakening qualities the seven factors of awakening, those three energizing ones of investigation, energy, joy, or rapture, and the three tranquilizing awakening qualities of calm, concentration, and equanimity itself, out of which comes the purest mindfulness, which is the first of the seven awakening factors. So here it's the job of equanimity um, to, to bring all those together in balance. So there's not one group running off like uh, one of the energy factors uh, kind of being ahead of the others. If you think of a pack of horses and they have the capability to, to all be in, in, in sync and run together. Uh, it's beautiful, for example, in riding with my friend in New Mexico riding horseback and coming across these Mustang, wild Mustang herds and seeing them run. Once in a while, there won't be one out front and it would cause the other ones to kind of catch up with it. And at other times it seemed that some lag and at yet other times they'd all be in sync running together. It's the same with the, the qualities of awakening. We can run off with too much energy or too much investigation, it starts to become analytical, uh, or too much joy where we get attached to that rapture, uh, too much concentration where we get attached to the serene states, the quiet states, uh, and come, you know, practice becomes oriented toward that the feel good aspects of meditation rather than the liberating. Uh, knowing the truth aspects of meditation. So it's like bringing all the horses into balance. So there's not one surging ahead and another lagging behind, but all kind of working together. That's how equanimity helps with the awakening factors. And the very last one I want to mention, actually, it's the fourth lens, is equanimity uh, as knowledge. And that's the equanimity uh, that comes as the last kind of insight stage before an awakening experience, before one touches the unconditioned Nibbana. So as, the, as a knowledge, it's, in, it's like the Tatra Majatata, it's in the midst of all things, that, that being here in middleness, where it's just completely attuned and seen and feeling uh, all the conditioned phenomena, all the bodily conditioned phenomena, all physical conditioned phenomena, and all mental phenomena. 
And so it's reached, our practice has reached the stage here, insight stage of equanimity, where it's knowing these formations while completely attuned to their, the aspect of their conditional nature that sets us free. And that is that they are all impermanent and that they are all dukkha, unreliable, unsatisfactory because they're impermanent and they are all incapable of control or absent of any controlling agency or entity. So by being attuned to this impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and uh, uncontrollability or selfless nature, then this equanimity, the intelligence, the intelligence of, of it or the insight of it is just seeing emptiness. It's unperturbed, un, undisturbed. With the Brahma Viharas, it's not being bothered by um, our, our and others pleasure and pain and gain and loss and praise and blame. It's just it's to do with how all beings have the fruits of their actions being played out all the time. All the pain and pleasure that we feel all the time as a result and all of our friends and animals are being played out in this as an insight and knowledge. This last lens, we're seeing it uh, from the place of liberation or, or that point just before a liberating uh, touching of the unconditioned is happen, can happen, is possible. We can't make it happen. All we can do is do the practice and the discipline to take us through the various stages of insight. And all along the way, we see the equanimity developing but then at, at its very maturest end, it is this knowledge where we view things through the lens of, of all conditioned phenomena being impermanent, being unreliable, being empty of self, uh, and this a sense of being completely okay. One could feel like it could just be there forever. It feels just as much being home as the Brahma Vihara equanimity does in another way. So they're very close and attributes are very, very similar. But with the Brahma Viharas, it's to do with relations with living beings and with, um, with our practice as an awakening quality or as a insight itself, equanimity is to do with all conditioned phenomena, period. And then, as I said at the beginning, as a, as a parami, it's something we can, we can reflect on and practice every day and see it as a bridge from practice to engagement, from meditation to non-meditation as a goodness quality, virtue to continually bring about. Um, so we can always find our way again and, and think what it is, what, 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 what touchstone for you can remind you of being a quantumist, a memory of a former sitting, a time when you were having a lot of equanimity, either Brahma Vihara or in Vipassana meditation, um, or just even having you know, a hand to heart or some object, some visualization that just is a way of calling forth the equanimity you know, when we feel its absence. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's anything further that Jake has to say or anyone has questions and answers. One quality of one aspect of this quality of equanimity. <laughs> is uh, 
not needing to do anything more when there's nothing more that needs to be done. <laughs> so I'd like to open it up after Darine's illustration of just receiving experience as it is not needing to do anything. And Stephen's beautiful exposition of this uh, non-doing in Brahma-Vihara mode and in awakening mode and in the insight quality. And the bridge of the paramis. Just open it up now to questions. Anything that we might be able to help with. And how to embody these aspects. In your own practice. anybody has any questions um, under the I think the reactions button there's a raise hand option we'll be able to see that and then I can invite you to unmute your mic um, depending on the version of zoom you have it might also be under the participants button but just raise your hand if you have a question Kathy? Hi, everyone. Hi, Kathy. Hi, thank you so much for the meditation and the talk. Um, so, um, for the last few months, I've had this, I've gotten this idea in my head that I really want to do. Um, like a longer retreat, um, like a few months, maybe like three or four. Um, and it's just been difficult because like, I think because of COVID and um, work, um, I just feel like, like there's such a strong desire to, to do this. But, and, and that feels like a hook, like that feels like a very sharp hook. Um, the fact that I, I don't know if this is gonna be possible um, and I don't even know if it's a good idea. Like I, I just don't know how the idea of a longer retreat would fit into my life and if it's even possible for it to fit into my life. Um, and I just find myself like going back to this wanting, like um, this wanting um, of doing this and then also recognizing that it might be not feasible. Um, and so there's like a lot of tension there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if there's anything that you- I have, I have a response and then maybe Darine or Jake, and my response is, if you know deep in your heart that you want to do a three or four month retreat, then as Jake said, there's nothing more to do. Mm. I'm implying that you just, 
go to, <laughs> that will happen. I, mm -hmm. I know that feeling is before I became, before I went to Burma and to ordain with Mahasi Sayada and practice with Upandita. Um, there was just so much. I was tethered to so many things in my daily life. Uh, um, some difficult, some painful, some skillful, some unskillful. It was just a kind of real kind of enmeshment in the world. But at a certain point, I knew that I had to go and ordain in Burma. And then, you know, the proximate cause for equanimity is said to be in, in terms of equanimity as an awakening factor is letting go. And it's similar to what Jake said, there's nothing more to do. And then it was still difficult. It was really hard my first weeks and months or so there, but that was okay. I knew what I needed to do. You know, a lot of things gave up. I had just met Michelle before we got together, you know, as a couple and, and have this lifelong relationship that we do. We're no longer together as a couple, but I just met her and had to leave <laughs> and array, make arrangements because I had to have a daughter and, you know, just, it seemed like impossible, kind of the way you're describing some of the things in your life holding you back, but, but nothing could stop it because of the clarity of what I needed to do for, for my life, to save my life. Darine, Jake. I just want to echo what Steve said in maybe some slightly different words, which is just to really honor the aspiration to really, um, you know, bow down to the goodness of that aspiration in a way that lets you let go of the details of how am I going to make this happen? but just really uh, treasuring, cherishing, resting in the goodness of that aspiration and then allowing it to happen in the way that Steve said. So that it's not a figuring out kind of an energy, <laughs> but a being carried kind of an energy. Thank you for a beautiful question. Good luck on your aspiration. <laughs> a beautiful, profound aspiration. You got them all into perfect non-doing, Steve. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> nothing more to do. <laughs> nothing more to do. <laughs> it's a shortened version of what I had had in mind. I thought of examples of how we're living now. The...
the pandemic dome of our lives on, in the world now and, and kind of what we, we face on a daily basis and you know long distance separations and um, kind of the restrictions that many of us have depending on where we are in, in the world. But I think you can apply that. I just wanted to give enough uh, kind of bare bones then to see where, how can any of this help under the conditions I or we are now living day to day. Or as some people say within the pandemic gloom a common mental mood, pandemic, gloom. Even some of our pets have this pandemic gloom. <laughs> Michelle's cats, they're all aware of something's going on beyond the norm. For one thing, Michelle hasn't gone anywhere for a year, which is the first time uh, that we hadn't been traveling for a year in like 20 or 30 years. So the cats are very confused. They don't know what to do. They hate when she leaves, but they're angry at her anyway for not petting them enough or the pattern of leaving and coming back and then giving, showering them with attention and pets and kitty whiskers. <laughs> Leslie, you have a question? Can you unmute? You're still muted. I'm trying to unmute you. <laughs> okay. Are you, uh, we can hear you, we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, um, I guess I didn't have a question until um, you mentioned, Steve, um, the pandemic. And I guess I'm lately really wrestling. Um, I'm a travel person too. I, I do a meditation all over the world usually and then travel. And, and of course that's been different. But um, so lately, uh, because I am of age, I did get my first vaccination and I had all this, you know, uh, feeling like, okay, uh, the second one, I can start thinking of more going out, which really inspires me. I'm an artist in many ways uh, in that way. And as a person, I just learned so much about myself at any rate. Um, I just talked to my daughter today and, um, so I guess there was a part of me happy that I've been inside for a year myself <laughs> and um, that that was going to shift somehow. But it, my daughter mentioned, well, it's not the time because um, she, even though you're vaccinated, there's a possibility you could give that to someone else. And I totally get that. But I guess... In speaking of that, uh, you know, this, uh, I, I guess this is a good talk for me. Equanimity just is as it is. Uh, but I wondered if you could say something about, um, I don't know, I guess living in a different world in the pandemic parameters of <laughs> that. Because I guess it's the same answer, but. Darine, Jake? I don't quite understand your question. <laughs> well, I, my question is the world to me is, is quite different as it is to many of us, many, many people. But for me, particularly because my world was so much um, travel and like that and in seeing my grandkids and like that, I, I don't, I guess because of the 
talk this morning with my daughter, I don't know how to quite uh, be in that equanimity with it, except I guess keep sitting. I, I don't, you know, maybe my question isn't clear because I'm not clear, you know, I just, um, it sounds more like just, a Brahma you know, Vihara equanimity that you're wanting to call up because it has to do with beings and relations and, and accepting of, of karma and results, accepting that, that uh, we're the owners of our action, our joys yeah. and sorrows are according to nature, not according to our wishes uh, or are your daughters or all beings joys and sorrows are according to nature, not according to what I wish for them, even yeah. though I wish them well and wish that things could be different. This is how it is. Yeah. But that kind of reflection can help get into the meaning of things or as they are as a Brahma Vihara equanimity. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's it. Uh, that, that my acceptance of things are as they are in, in just right. in letting go of everything else. So that's the practice. I mean, equanimity, equanimity is probably the most profound kind of unconditional acceptance okay. as well as stability. So uh, it's one thing to want to do it, another thing to call it up. And the most important, it's up to us to to train, to practice, and to bring it to moments of fruition, to taste it. And, and once we do with awareness, its likelihood of coming back is very high. When, when we see with, un, and understand with wisdom what a moment of equanimity does to our systems, then we know it's worthy of pursuing, of training. Okay. Thank you. Aileen? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your question, or for, the, for taking my question. Um, it's really kind of the inverse of what Michelle asked, I guess. I maybe touch a little bit more on motivation for retreat. I find myself, um, you know, in a state of confusion and that existential confusion and wanting to retreat for some clarity. And, um, you know, I'm like, is, is that, is that kind of to her question, like, is that a, a grasping, uh, I don't know, a, a valid motivation for, for having thoughts of retreat and, and, I don't know, I guess I'm just testing whether it's an escape or, you know, is it a calling up of more equanimity to be okay with the confusion? Um, you know, I don't know, just any it thoughts? It makes sense, it's a good question. Uh, and it's a good investigation, you know, which is a, a, an awakening quality to, to investigate the motivation or the intention itself, mm -hmm. which likely changes. So at least one of them, at least one of the motivations that you have is, is, is clarity. That's a good motivation. Mm. That's a worthy motivation to, to find clarity. And, and you might find other ones as well, you know, the, just the, the joy of understanding um, the whole pattern of the whole process, the moments of clarity, the moments of, no, of non-clarity or confusion. You know, and in all that, just the motivation, ultimately it, it, our deepest motivation for awakening is to overcome uh, the, the confusion, the bewilderment, the delusion with the light of, of knowing, the light of awakening. So however you frame it, you just wanna to look to see that there's not any excessive attachment you know, that's causing your mind to oscillate and waver and be uncertain mm -hmm. to, to, to get to that place almost where there's just a certainty about what you want to do, what you need to do. 
and your and your whole system responds to that intention. Your whole system feels re relaxed that you have that intention to take those steps, to know that clarity, you know? And in the process, you'll find, you know, that the equanimity is likely to accompany you, to accompany this process, mm -hmm. you know, and make clear what is excessive and, and what isn't, what is, um, feels like is an es escape and what feels like it's the deep Dhamma desire to understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us and for your practice. Um, we're very happy to see you and uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Take care. Practice those qualities until there's nothing more to do. <laughs> Say hello to everyone. Send metta. And be equanimity for everyone. And thank everyone for the equanimity that's coming into our hearts and the unconditional loving kindness and care and compassion, and empathetic joy. <laughs> Maybe next week, Jake can talk a little bit about joy. He's, he, he gets very joyous talking about joy. <laughs> I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Good motivation. Thanks, Amanda. Yes, see you next week. Thank thanks you. For the, thanks for the beautiful guidance, Dorine. Yes. De nada. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve, Amanda, everyone. Aloha. Have a good Adios. week. Adios. <laughs>